Cool. And then uh, hopefully not too much longer, uh, I will get the properties of the differential privacy done and then we can move to, uh, to the project presentation. Uh, so there are four different uh, properties I want to mention and just want to get you the overall idea and how things are done in practice. Um, so one very, very useful composition theorem here about differential privacy is that if you are working with independently, okay, an epsilon one differentially private algorithm and another epsilon two differentially private algorithm, like you're doing it sequentially, you can think about it that way, or even at the same time, and then it will result in another differential private um, um, algorithm, but then the, um, the, the uh, privacy budget that you spent in the two steps will have to be added up together. Okay, so that means if I have a um, epsilon one, epsilon one for my first part, epsilon two for my second part, both of them are privacy budgets, right? So when we combine them, well, uh, we are essentially uh, combining the privacy budget together. So formally, we have this result. I'm not, I'm not going to bother you of the details here, but it's uh, just talking about um, formally how the idea is being um, put into mathematical form. The handout includes the proof um, if you want to take a look. And for us, the most important thing uh, I think is to, first of all, there's one generalization that, well, not only this two, right? If I want to add three, add four, five, et cetera, et cetera. So you have this result of the uh, sum of the epsilon i, okay? And uh, which if you have k different, for example, like a k different um, uh, algorithms you're working with, then uh, doing them together will give you um, the sum of all of the epsilon as the total privacy budget. Uh, but another way, which I was saying is important to, uh, to think about the whole thing is that, well, uh, we know that if you combine the two, you uh, combine the two um, differentially private algorithms, you result in a, a whole entire differential privacy algorithm with the combined um, privacy budget. Uh, but more importantly, we should think about, well, if, if I'm only allowed a fixed total um, privacy budget for my, for my query outputs and adding noise and all that, uh, if I have to do multiple, right, if I have to, like say, if I receive multiple queries and I have to respond to them um, together or like at the same time, then I have to spend my privacy budget one by one, right, little by little. Okay, maybe you like say you have fixed number, let's say if we have uh, three different queries sent to you at the same time about the same database. Uh, then, well, if we start with epsilon, well, maybe we have to do some kind of divide, right, either equally. Uh, epsilon divided by three uh, to be used for each particular query output, uh, or maybe not evenly, but whichever works uh, in the context you're working with. Okay, so yes, the composition theory is really talking about in the forward way that, well, if we do two separate or multiple separate independent differentially private budget, uh, differentially private algorithms, then the combined result in the end will be the combined privacy budget. Okay, but then on the other hand, if you are given a fixed total privacy budget and then you have to produce multiple query outputs to add noise to them, and then you are like spending or splitting the total privacy budget uh, to each of the particular query output that you're working with. Okay, so that leads to our sequential composition here. If M queries are sent to the same data set, the privacy budget, so an easy way to do this, as you can see, is to divide it by M. So you have your total epsilon, let's just say 0.1, and then let's just say we send multiple, uh, like um, three, three different queries to this. Then for each of the query output, I have to use this epsilon nu to be the uh, ratio of epsilon and m, that's how many queries I'm working with, and then this will be my new privacy budget that I have to work with. Example that I provided here is, let's just say we're adding a Laplace noise to four, queries, okay? Um, this is just a toy example. Uh, the four different queries here are what is the average income of the sample, what is the average expenditures of the sample, and then also uh, the variance of the two uh, different variables here, okay? So let's just say if you started off with epsilon to be 0.4, uh, 0.1, and you have four different um, queries here, so you should define your epsilon nu to be the ratio of this two, and then notice that here, um, of course, um, you will have to compute all of this from your data base, and then you have to define all of the delta F accordingly. 
and then make sure that you're dividing by the epsilon mu. Right? This is because, well, we are only allowed to spend privacy budget epsilon in total. Okay, but now we're forced, we're faced, I should say, with four different queries, and we have to spend them in this way uh, equally. Uh, but of course, you can you can do another thing, like say maybe uh, maybe what is it one fifth for each of the three, and then two fifths for the last one, whichever is fine. Uh, but make sure that you only spend uh, the total epsilon, and then that of course the foundation is based on the composition theory that we're talking about, especially the generalization over here. Okay, so if you have the fixed total, then you have to spend them um, in some way that you have the fixed total unchanged. All right, so um, one quick question or comment here is that, well, if we look at um, adding Laplace noise to the income average, uh, when you only have one query and when you have four queries to work with, and if your epsilon is the same, so clearly epsilon divided by four are gonna be smaller than epsilon, right? So if you have to respond to four queries at the same time to the same database, you are essentially adding more noise to each of them, okay? Because you start to have a smaller epsilon. Okay, so here, epsilon is 0.1, right? So the epsilon mu will be 0.1 divided by four, which is 0.025, okay? This is smaller, right? Smaller than 0.1, obviously. So um, if you're doing this for the income average, they have the same delta, okay, once you fix it. But then of course, depending on the value of epsilon, you will have um, one, uh, the first one will have smaller noise because it has larger uh, epsilon. The second one will have a larger noise because epsilon nu is smaller than epsilon. Okay, so this is a good contrast to, to make as you're thinking through the process, okay? All right, um, however, um, not every time you will have to divide the privacy budget. And uh, now we're telling you another composition is called parallel composition. From the name, you can start to see that, well, things are in some way in parallel. So, so we probably don't have to spend the privacy budget in the way that we're thinking. So if you have M queries that sent to the same database, but on non-overlapping subsets of the data set, the privacy budget does not need to be divided by M. Okay, so see here that, well, yes, you're making queries to the same database, but each of the query is talking about a separate or not overlap subset of the data set. In that case, we do not need to divide it by the number of queries that you, you uh, are sending or you're receiving, okay? Uh, just to give you an example, if I have two queries like this, what is the average income of rural CUs, okay? And what is the average income of urban CUs? If you think about this, well, we know that the urban rural um, variable is binary, right? So each CU is either rural or either urban. So actually, when you're asking or when you receive two queries like this, we're talking about two non-overlapping, they're actually complement because it's either rural or not, right? So they're not overlapping and they're a complement, but the main reason is that they're not overlapping. Uh, so that's why, because the two queries are sent to separate and not overlapping subsets of the data set. So when you're working with um, your privacy budget division, in this case, you don't have to divide because they are separate to um, two separate subsets of the data set. Okay, so this sounds might be um, a little bit uh, tricky and surprising, um, but this is actually um, something really useful to consider, especially like compare this, the parallel to the sequential, okay? And now if you come back to uh, the four examples that I gave over here, they are actually to the entire sample, right? There is no subset, I mean, it, like each of the four queries here, they're all about the entire sample. So it's not about not overlapping subsets or anything. Uh, so in this case, we will have to do um, the division, epsilon divided by n. Okay. And um, I didn't provide a code, but you will, I think, if you are ever going to do this in the future, uh, hopefully you, you get this idea that you are able to implement that in R. Uh, the last one is post-processing is mainly uh, dealing with contingency tables, meaning that if we're working with counts of observations in each category of a categorical variable, 
And um, well, the short story here is that, well, the total counts we know, like if we're working with a categorical variable, I think in the example you will see in the CE data is about the uh, counts of, uh, let's see, I think there's a categorical variable about the race category of the reference person. It has six categories, okay? So the total number of the observation we know is 944. Uh, nine, nine four, sorry. And then C, in this case, the category is six, okay? So what we're saying, if you imagine that, well, the total is always 994, no matter how we're adding noise, right? We want to make sure that, well, the data is still meaningful, that when I add noise to my accounts, so it's six levels, so one, two, three, four, five, right? I'm adding noise to each of the counts, but then I still want to make sure that it add up to the total, right? And that's what we call post-processing. That if you're working with something like this, well, maybe just start with the first five, okay? And when you start with the first five, and then the last one will just be the sum divided by the, the sum of the first five once you add the noise, okay? So that's the short story. Uh, but the key here is that, well, if you're only working with the first five, then the count, Sorry, the, the number of levels uh, we should dividing the we should be dividing epsilon with uh, should be c minus one. Okay, because now you think about earlier we used m to define this. That's like m different queries. So now if I'm asking um, asking making the query making six different queries about the count of each of the categories, then essentially if I start with the first five, uh, I'm dividing my total privacy budget into five different um, different portions because I'm adding noise to five cells, okay? But then in the end, the last cell will just be the total mm, 994 minus the noise added version of the first five that I got, okay? So that's the short story of the example. Well, it looks a little bit long, but I'm just repeating in words one by one about, um, about the six different possible queries that you can make about this categorical variable, okay? Uh, how many is used with reference person's race category is white, okay, and then black, Native American, Asian, uh, Pacific Islander, and multi-race, okay. So, uh, quick example here, epsilon is 0.1, C is 6, okay, so the epsilon nu should be epsilon divided by C minus 1, and then of course there are a bunch of intermediate uh, steps here, I just, um, I didn't include them, um, but you, you get the point that we are working with different categories of the rays, five of them, we're adding noise to each of them. So this is the final added noise added version of each. And then to get the last one, you use the sum n, which is 994 in the example, minus each of this that you're getting, okay? Some subtlety here is that because each of the rays, like say race one, two, three, four, five, all of this, they should be count, right? They should be integer. So you can use the round um, function that we showed you earlier. Um, in the example to, to get to a rounded number. And there are certain things, again, um, that you might want to deal with. For example, some of the categories are really low, I think, um, I think race three. Um, the true count of it is already really low. So when you add noise, uh, sometimes you might, you might unfortunately push it into like a negative number, uh, which we know that shouldn't happen. Uh, so typically, I mean, there's no, agreed um, method to deal with that, but typically what people do is, well, if it's a count, you should never go below zero. So in that case, um, if you get something below than zero, you just bound, like you truncate it as zero and um, certain things like that, okay? And similarly, say race one, it might be very much populated. So when you add noise, it might go beyond N possible, sometimes depends on how large your epsilon is, right? And if that is the case, you should always truncate it at the top. Okay, so those are uh, some little um, technical issues um, if, you, if you perform this kind of implementation. Um, and then I want to uh, show you all that with like this toy example. So hopefully, hopefully that overall makes sense to you. And um, any questions before we get to the point that you can present your um, project progress? I mean, I know I never uh, gave any homework or anything, which is fine. I mean, it's towards the end um, of the semester about this uh, material. And also I should mention that this is uh, probably um, 
less familiar to most of us, especially if we come from a statistical um, background, like all of this. Um, my, I mean, algorithm-based thinking about is probably, I mean, again, differential privacy, the idea and all that is uh, coming from uh, computer science. Um, but if you ever, ever in the future um, do, I don't know, apply work or research about this field, I mean, especially in the future, near future, or even long future, longer future, I think um, differential privacy will definitely be, um, be the way people do things, okay? And um, so next week, I will mention a couple, like, couple more uh, methods um, before we get to the end of the semester. So, so far you have seen that differential privacy, the one that we're being covering here, is just, is just adding noise, right? Adding noise to, um, to, to occurring. And um, the next week, uh, I will try to cover a couple of methods that uh, people are trying to combine differential privacy and synthetic data, okay? In a sense that, well, synthetic data is really using, using modeling, right? Like we can have, well, all kinds of Bayesian models if that, if that works for you. And, um, and then synthetic data is focused on synthesis, right? We're using models and then we generate actual new data here. Differential privacy, based on what we have seen so far, is adding random noise, okay? That can satisfy epsilon differential privacy. In particular, we cover this Laplace mechanism because it satisfies differential privacy, but it's adding noise as opposed to synthesis, okay? So next week, and also, um, well, in the future, if you ever want to know more about this, um, um, I believe um, marrying the idea of synthetic data set and differential privacy will be the future, at least one of the futures. Um, so next week, uh, I'm gonna show you a couple of methods how that can happen uh, to a certain type of data, okay? But a lot of the research uh, in this field is um, I mean, ongoing, people are debating uh, how to define things, how to um, like prove things and all that. So it's definitely open-ended and um, will be definitely a growing and promising uh, research area in the future. All right, okay, so without further ado,